You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. This week, Father Paul takes questions and discussion on the meaning and usage of Hebrew terminology in Genesis. I am delighted to introduce Father Paul on the Bible as Literature podcast, Tarazi Tuesdays. So, Father, in the last chapter, in chapter 22, we talked a lot about Yarash, and now we're using Ahuza and Mikna. Can you tease out a little more the difference between these words? Yes. Although, before I forget, I'm getting old, let's remember, and this is a scriptural twist, that the repetition of verbs meaning possession are intentionally linked with the tomb. (laughs) That's a twist against you that if you want to possess something, the only way to prove that you are the possessor is to be buried there. This is very well known, and you know the trouble here with the cemetery or in your backyard if you bury. Notice in the Old West here, and even before, I mean, you bury in your backyard. You cannot bury somewhere else, because if you can point to someone this is the grave of my grandfather, it is as though you're saying that this is my land. I mean, we all know this. So let's make it functional. That would be my first reaction. Let's remember, it's not that. Here it is so, and there it is so. That the inheritance is through the living legacy of the descendants, Isaac and so on, who could have died if God would have maintained his plan. You see, if you take these two chapters together as a teaching, okay? This being said, as a caveat to my hearers, let's go into the technicalities as you have asked. Ahaz is the classic take which is another side of the same coin as receive. Like, take could mean that you took something or you took something I offered you. Okay? That's the English take and the Greek lamvano. Look at the New Testament. Very often lamvano is translated as took or received. So it does not annul the fact that something was handed to you. But it could also mean that you acquired it. Kana is more along the lines of acquiring because the root reflects possession that now you are the possessor. Okay, let me push the issue by saying that the word jealous is something that someone who puts himself before is kinne. The Lord is a jealous God, kinne. In other words, you have to take into consideration that he is referential. And until now, muqtanayat, in Arabic means your possessions, you are the proprietor. In Arabic, akhada, it's like Hebrew, means to take, which could be to take something someone is offering you. It doesn't work in Arabic to use it to refer to your possessions. Whereas muqtanayat and Mulkiyat that is what 
you now own as a proprietor. So the text in 23, because that would be the total answer to the question, notice that it gives precedence more to Ahuza over Mikne once. It leaves that feel that we're talking about something that was, let me put it this way, that was allowed to Abraham to take. It's not you grabbed like Hazak, that would be the ultimate. But this Ezekiel put it always in reference to God, that he is the one who grabs. And Yarash is always technical that it is at the good pleasure of the one who grants it to you. And let me push the issue and point out how the hifail of Yarash to make inherit it's strange, unless you understand the original, that the same translations in Joshua translated sometimes as gave as possession or dispossess. Because he failed means to have someone be the heir, but which means that if that someone has the authority to do so, then by the same token, the moment I choose one of my children as heir, and you cannot have more than one heir, I am technically dispossessing the other children from heirdom. You allowed me to go on this tangent, which is very important. That's very strange. The same exact hifail. And what gives the meaning? It is the context. Israel, to whom he's giving the land, you say he gave it as an inheritance. And then later you say he dispossessed the nations before you. But you use the same word that, in my mind, is intentional to remind you that the sole one that decides the matter of inheritance is God. You, the heir, has no value per se, even Jesus in Galatians chapter 4, very clearly. And that's what theologians don't like to hear, although the church decided to have it read at every Christmas, but then they turn around it. It is as though, come on, God had no choice but to choose his only son to be the heir. God has no choice, but since when? This is what theology does. It forces the hand of God. It makes him a toy you have produced in your own company to function in a certain way. No, you can. And that, I believe, is one of the greatest lessons of the book of Joshua. Horish. The same translations, beginning with the Septuagint and RSV, KGV. You're bound, you're forced to translate it into different ways. But still, you know, the stress I give to the importance of language. What allows it to be so, except the premise that he is the only one to whom the hif'il form can be applied. You are Yarash, you receive inherit. Hmm? Not the inheritor, but the heir maker and thus the heir unmaker is God.
remember Matthew pushes this to the extreme in his famous parable, which is Lucan, that he invited no one came, went by and forced the people to come. And you assume with Luke, though, okay, now everybody is in. Suddenly in Matthew at the end, you have a twist. Hmm, what are you doing here without the garment I left for you at the entrance? And people tell me, but he's free to do that. I said, no, 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 no. In major restaurants, say, tie is required. And if you don't have one, we'll supply you one. See how I love America. But you're not going to sit without a tie if I say that you must have a tie. So that would be my total. Uh, I didn't want only to stick to the verbs, but I wanted also, as I try to do in all my podcasts, to set them within the context of Scripture. And always with examples because that's the only way to make your point. In your commentary on Genesis, you talked about the word field, sade, and how it occurs originally in Genesis chapters 2 and 3 and doesn't appear again until chapter 23. It is in the field that Ephron proved to be a true son of Adam, the true human being he offered to a stranger, the field that Cain did not want to share with his own brother. Very good. I mean, field, you have it in 2, 3, then in four with Canaan, with Cain in the field, and then in 23.9, clearly. This is where you have it. And exactly, there is also, I call it a play, there is a use. If it is there, you can't impose something on the text. But it is functional in chapter two and three. It is functional in chapter four and it disappears, and it becomes functional in chapter 23, where you have it repeated, and then in chapters 24 and 25, and it is as though chapter 26 relaunches it. But then the interesting thing is that the open field of Genesis 2, 3, 4 is presented as the field of Ephron the Hittite of the children of Het in 23. And thus, this cannot leave your mind while you are hearing the following chapters. Because the field is actually another expression of the Adama. It's a localized Adama. and the afar is the dust, and then we heard another word that means the red. So that's the way things are. Uh, Later, you will notice, we'll hear about Iso, Edom, Edom, and the red lentils, and so on. If you hear it in the original, and then Edom, let me go on a tangent here because I can link things together. Actually, I discussed this in my commentary on Isaiah, where Edom also is the red of the fire and the blood. That's why Edom is a very dangerous mountain because this is where God can slaughter the people or burn them with fire and so on. But there is a link in the language. In English, you cannot make it because you have to say blood, you have to say ground, you have to say red, and you have to say fire. These are four different words. But in Hebrew, it's the same triliteral Adam that connects Adam with the Adama, with Edom, and with the blood and the fire through the red. And again, you know, as I repeat myself, I mean, I'm old, I'm entitled, you know. It just, this happens in all languages. It's not only scriptural Hebrew, but in a certain scripture, in other words, you're reading a book or a play by a famous writer. 
you have to show the interaction within the same story. It's like Harry Potter. You cannot jump from here to there and so because then it's your thing. But how do you show me that the author intentionally did that? You cannot do it in translation. It's impossible. It could work here and there. Don't misunderstand me. Now, I used earlier take and receive. They can go either way through the same verbs. But you can't expand this all the way. And you have to show me that it is in English. Another verb, although it doesn't apply directly, but it's good for my hearers to listen to this. They said, no, it's not so. There are verbs that mean only one thing. To take and to bring. Well, how many times you hear people say, yesterday I brought my son to school, or yesterday I took my son to school. Although they are in the opposite direction. But you have to explain. The explanation, according to me, which I'm sure is the correct one, is depending on the assumption you put yourself in when you are speaking. If you are assuming that you are at school, you say, I brought my son to school. The assumption is that you're speaking from home. Is it? And this is the point I like to make. Everybody understand it and don't argue about it. That's the main point in my presentation. And I'm asking the people to do with the Hebrew text the way they handle, I took my son or I brought my son to school. That's all I'm asking. We have an example of this, Father, in English, where rent. I can rent you a lawnmower, or you can rent a lawnmower from me. The British would disagree with you. They would differentiate between let and rent. But who cares? We are in the independent United States of America, and we decide how to use the language. It struck me that the root of the name het comes from hatat, which means fear or confound or break. It's the sound of the enemy. Would you care to go into some of the implications of the fact that it was this one who represents those who break their enemies or who confound their enemies, which God does to his enemies elsewhere in the Bible? Most probably, all I can say, I never thought about it as much as I thought about the Philistines and the verb palash and spread and so on. But it could be the same, even if the original, in other words, even if the original Hittite noun is het. In your writing, you can play on that if it fits your language. It's like people tell me, but there were Philistines we have, we can prove to you that. I say, I have no problem with that. All I'm saying is that the author may be playing on that on the Hebrew triliteral, even if it is transliteration. But you have to show it. And very probably because they are, you know, majestic people. They are very much, let me put it this way, that's why I don't have any trouble to show that they are. Uh, Ephraim the Hittite behaves as God behaves in 22, because, uh, you know, also geographically and so on, they are in the land that is at the sources of the Euphrates and the Tigris and so on. I mean, all these things play in the mind of the original hearer. Now, most of the people do not know where Turkey is, let alone the Hittites. But I'm saying in the ear of the original hearer, it plays. For the general hearer, het is with a tau, which is a different consonant than the tet, because the root 
het with that has to do with sin. It's originally the empire of Hattusa. Yes, oh. yes, Hattusa. Okay, so they took the first part as is out of respect for these people. If it is used, because the only way to show that is to do what you did to show me that the terror and so on in other instances has these two consonants. Take, for instance, the river Kebar. There could be a river Kebar. In Lebanon, we have Nahr al-Kabir. And you could even decide that it's oxymoronic. It's like calling Tadmur the indomitable or the city of Cairo, al qahira means the victorious. It was a small city there. You call it to give it a terrific name. If there is a Kebar, and I know that there is a Kebar, which is a small river, but it was played upon and chosen by the Prophet because that's what he wanted to say, that God in exile does not have a temple it's like a spot of little water, Biha, but he is the Hoseq, the one who controls everything. But for someone who knows Hebrew and Arabic, you know it, Allahu Akbar, Akbar Kabir. You know. So there must be a connection in the language in which you are writing. And in my book, when I refer to that, I showed that this root is found in the scriptural Hebrew as connoting greatness. So it's not Arabic only. You have to be very careful. The triliteral kabar is found in the biblical Hebrew. So you have to show that. But it's usually easier if you are in the same family of languages, like Semitic languages of, or Romance languages, because you have a connection. It's easier to jump from French to Spanish and Latin and Italian as going to English, you know, or German. Or so. so you have to show. That's why you notice in some of my answers, I'm tentative. But the tentativeness has to be educated. First of all, you have to know the original. Secondly, you have to show how in actuality things can be connected. You don't say a lamb, barak. You say a camel. You know. uh, and again, that's how we do things in life. The word for Hittite, first of all... The but Hattusha, yes. Yeah, Hattusha. So, First of all, it's not a Semitic language. Correct. That's what it was originally spoken in. But something happened because it went from hot to hit. The Semitic languages did something to the word to make it native to theirs. The only one which is original, kept original, very clear because it's a long word, Arpakshad. You know, I think it's concocted, you know, but uh, I understand, but it's very strange. Arpakshad, you have a double, double, double follow. But the rest you could see, you know, you can. Uh, falash for me is very clear. I mean, spoken Arabic, like I said, when you deal, open the cards, you say, Flushu. I mean, we, we hear it. You spread something. Okay. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.